Okay, this will be the last one I do without my microphone back. Hopefully the audio stays consistently okay. I noticed in the last video it kind of went in and out a little bit. So fingers crossed it is still manageable. I thought it was definitely up to acceptability. I'm going to talk about thyroid today. I've spoken about thyroid recently in a few things, actually. There is a TRT troubleshooting lecture, which encompasses thyroid to some degree. There is a full webinar version of the chapter on thyroid from Beyond TRT for Merrick Health, which is also on the TRT and Hormone Optimization channel. You can watch all that content for free. As well as if you would like to support me and have a referenceable guide on this, you can also download Beyond TRT from the website in the description. And you will have the entire gamut of my thyroid knowledge uh, in a condensed, easy to read, understandable form. But this is not going to be an ad for my book. This is going to be more of a discussion point around the things that I've spoken about in those lectures and in that book. And I'm going to try to offer some additional value insight. I guess just more of an opinion piece on thyroid. I think thyroid is something that gets fucked up more than it gets right. Uh, there's a lot of commonalities in that in this space. And one thing that I see happen a lot is T4 monotherapy and people not using proper thyroid treatments to treat hypothyroidism. That's number one. And I think that's why thyroid therapy gets quite a bit of a bad rap in the forums. But I also think that another thing that happens, well, not think, I also know that another thing that happens a lot is improper diagnoses of hypothyroidism, both in terms of not finding out that hypothyroidism is there when it's there, or even wrongly diagnosing it when it is. And there are, again, not everything falls into categories, not everything falls into cookie cutter protocols, but things definitely fall into buckets. And I would say that there are two buckets, maybe with a third pseudo bucket that I'm going to discuss. But when we're looking at hypothyroidism, what I have found, and if you'd asked me this a couple of years ago, I probably would have given a different answer because with more experience has come more knowledge and my camera is blurring in and out. My apologies. Once I fix the backdrop here, I'm not going to use the blur and that won't be an issue anymore. But going back to the original point, one thing that is crucial if you are going to go on hormone replacement therapy or if you are thinking of going on hormone replacement therapy is, again, broken record alert, get your fucking comprehensive blood work done. But most importantly, on that panel, make sure that you assess your full thyroid function. Now, TSH is not a full thyroid function test. And if you're in Australia and you go through the public health care system, even if your doctor puts a note down to test TSH T3, T4, which should be the bare minimum, if your TSH comes back within range, which is, I believe, up to 4.5, depending on the lab, the lab will even forego actually checking this, even though your doctor has requested it. So a lot of the time, you will need to do this privately. If you're in the States, you can use the Merrick uh, Basic Health Panel. If you're in the UK, I think MediChex, it's called like Ultimate Performance or something along those lines. Comprehensive blood testing for all hormones, including thyroid, is paramount. But what you also need to do is you need to get a snapshot of your full thyroid activity. So I like to have TSH, T3, T4, thyroid antibodies, both for Hashimoto's and Graves. Graves is very rare, but at least it's worth checking for just once when you're going through everything. And today I'm going to talk about reverse T3. And reverse T3 is a useful tool for getting a proxy for whether your thyroid dysfunction is induced by stress. Because in my experience, going back to the analogy of the buckets, is that we can have autoimmune thyroid issues, we can have stress-induced thyroid issues, and we can have non-autoimmune subclinical hypothyroidism. They tend to be the three buckets. Now, is there crossover between three? Yes. The good news here is that these two buckets you can get yourself out of. This bucket, not so much. Now, you can do things that support Hashimoto's. You can do things that will offset the degradation of your thyroid further if you are fortunate enough to catch it early. And by fortunate, I generally mean strategic enough. Maybe you get a good doctor if you can find a unicorn. But the way that this should be treated should be treated differently. However, the medications are often the same. And this is where it gets too, too nuanced for a lot of people and it just goes over their head. And they're not interested in unpacking this further. So I'm going to try to unpack all three of these buckets in 15 minutes. I've got 10 minutes left. And then we can call it a day. So 
Number one, Hashimoto's. One thing that I talk about in Beyond TRT as well as the Beyond TRT webinar is what I would coin the subclinical Hashimoto's. I don't know if this is a real coined term. If it is, cool. If it's not, I'm coining it now. This is when you can have your antibodies elevated, but not beyond the reference range. Or you can have one of the two antibodies elevated and your TSH and T3 will be well, the former elevated and the second likely suppressed, but only within a subclinical range. Now, this means that you have the genetics and the autoimmune activity for Hashimoto's. It just hasn't gone full-blown raging yet. Now, in this case, if the individual has symptoms... I think it is asinine, and this is just my opinion, I'm not a medical doctor, I think it's asinine if someone has symptoms and someone has the autoimmune activity to show that their thyroid is currently being degraded, that you wait until it completely goes to shit to make them better. That doesn't make any fucking sense to me. I think it makes much more sense to initiate natural desiccated thyroid or a T3, T4 combination if you can't get NDT or if you don't tolerate NDT in a conservative dose to support the thyroid and then ideally support the health and the stress of the body, if possible, to prevent further degradation of thyroid function. So what often happens is guys will come in to see their local doctor who may be somewhat of a thyroid guru, I use that term loosely, and their TSH will be elevated to maybe a 2.5, 3, 3.5, and they'll have mild Hashimoto's antibodies but below the range, but it won't be zero and the doctor will go, no, nah, you're good. Your symptoms are coming from something else. Go get yourself a diagnosis for inattentive ADHD. You've got chronic fatigue syndrome. You've got adrenal fatigue or some other nonsense bullshit that they will make up because the individual has hypothyroidism. It just hasn't reached a full-blown blowout. Kind of like if someone is insulin resistant but not full-blown diabetic, we have a term for this called pre-diabetes, but we don't really have a term for this called pre-Hashimoto's. We should, because it's the same thing, just milder. So that's number one. I believe in treating that, but also using a combination of that treatment. So usually initiating NDT at a lower dose. The other thing with Hashimoto's that's tricky is that thyroid function tends to fluctuate more day to day in response to stresses as well. So I believe that it's best, again, my opinion, to go in with a more conservative dose, give the patient or client time to titrate up so that they can tolerate it, but then work on the second category, which is the stress-induced hypothyroidism. This is where I'm a big believer in checking reverse T3, because what this will show you is how much of the thyroid dysfunction is coming from the receptor not being properly agonized by T3 due to too much stress in the body. This can be psychological stress. This can be biological stress. This can be drugs and alcohol. This can be PTSD. There can be so many different things. Chronic pain is a big one as well. There can be so many factors that are causing this. And ideally, in a perfect world, we can go, ah, oh, okay, you're stressed out. Stop being so fucking stressed. Problem solved. The problem is that stress, hygiene, things like mindfulness, meditation, breath work, going to bed early, learning to actually manage your stresses in life, has the lowest, lowest compliance out of anything I have ever worked with. So supplements can help, but ideally we want to be able to fix the underlying issue. But if you're doing shift work, if you're going through a messy divorce, if someone close to you has just passed away or you've got severe trauma in your past that you've been unable to integrate, this is easier said than done. And I think this should move into a either intractable or pseudo intractable uh, state that we can identify this and go, okay, we can do our best to support the body in a stressed state if we're not able to resolve the underlying stressor. I like to use supplements like phosphatidylserine. I find this is the most effective and best tolerated stress reducing supplement. Again, I've done a full lecture on phosphatidylserine as well as CBD. I find that CBD is particularly effective for people who have Hashimoto's antibodies as well as uh, elevated reverse T3. High prolactin and high cortisol are often seen in this as well, but not always, case by case. These can also be good proxies, particularly if reverse T3 is not available for you or if it's too expensive. Other ones that work well to supplement those further, but I think a lower hanging fruit. Uh, well, firstly, omega-3 fish oil, three to four grams of combined EPA DHA per day is fantastic. If you are afraid of oxidized fish oil, you can use krill oil, uh, one to two grams, even up to three grams per day. I like the Neptune version or the version from Sports Research, and I can't remember the patented version from that. Glycine, 5 to 10 grams of glycine a day. Theanine, 2 to 600 milligrams a day of that a day is fantastic as well. But 
These are going to be things that are going to help support bringing the stress down. But ideally, what we want to be able to do is help you manage your stresses better or treat the underlying root cause of the stress. Now, the last category is just plain old subclinical hypothyroidism. And this can often be induced by hypogonadism. So it's very important that when you're looking at your overarching symptoms, that you understand that if we have a list of low testosterone symptoms and we have a list of hypothyroid symptoms, you'll find that they're the same fucking thing because both of them impact a lot of the same subjective processes in the body. And one of the biggest farces that I see in hypothyroidism is the cliche of, oh, it makes your hands and feet cold. Yeah, it, that's one of the symptoms, but men run hotter than women. So a lot of the time, the primary symptom of hypothyroidism in men is anxiety, depression, and all the symptoms of inattentive ADHD. Plus, you will also find that things like low sex drive, low threshold distress, easy gaining weight, low energy, exercise intolerance, all the things that we look at with low testosterone are also present in low thyroid because T3 is extremely important for regulating the body's metabolism as well as neurotransmission. So this is going to put you in a low energy, high stress state if you have hypothyroidism. And the problem is that the secondary hypothyroidism can often be caused by other things that may or may not be able to be resolved. So if you have low testosterone and low thyroid function, what you want to work out is which one is the lower hanging fruit and can we do something to resolve both of these issues or which one should we intervene with first? And this is where, if you're watching this and going, fuck, this sounds way too complicated, I can't do that. That's the fucking point. You're meant to have someone who's got experience with this to come in and go, yep, this is the lowest hanging fruit, or yep, this is the lowest hanging fruit, or look, you've got Hashimoto's and you've got hypothyroidism. We're going to treat both, or we're going to treat the Hashimoto's first. We're going to see if the testosterone comes up. We're going to treat the thyroid first, see if the testosterone comes up. We're going to treat the testosterone first, see if that supports the thyroid. This is meant to be complex. And that's why jumping on the internet and asking questions in forums is going to create more problems than it's going to solve. But in this instance, I have found that if testosterone is severely low and the hypothyroidism is subclinical, if you come in with testosterone and NDT at the same time, putting the testosterone in is going to push the thyroid up and this can induce hyperthyroidism. So what I'm a big believer in, same with growth hormone, is that if testosterone is the lowest hanging fruit and the individual is going to make the choice to go with testosterone replacement therapy or testosterone optimization therapy, whatever you want to call it, I prefer that people wait 12 to 16 weeks, at least maybe even six months to see if their thyroid function improves from resolving the baseline low testosterone state. Because a lot of the time, the subclinical hypothyroidism if reverse T3 is not elevated and Hashimoto's antibodies are not elevated, this can often be a symptom and a outcome of the low testosterone state. So in summary, hypothyroidism has the same medication treatment for all of these things, but there are different things that we need to do in conjunction with potentially treating the hypothyroidism. And the ultimate thing to understand with hypothyroidism is start low, go slow. Introduce NDT or T3, T4 in combination, never use T4 monotherapy, it never works. And do it in a way that you can titrate up gradually so that you don't induce an overactive thyroid state one, but also you get a good understanding of what's actually going on with your health and biology to potentially allow you to intervene with as few systems as possible so that you can really focus your efforts on supporting your holistic overall health and allowing the body to thrive and work the way that it's supposed to on its own. Hope that helps.